God, we worship your holy name, your mighty name. We thank you for the breath that we take every day. We thank you for the love that you give us, even when we are unworthy of it. We thank you for the hope that you provide in our future as we follow you. kind of abruptly. Um, well, listen, like I said earlier, if you, if you weren't here when I, when I introduced myself earlier, my name is Joe. I am I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. My, I, I'm one of the pastors here, and today I'm just excited to be able to share the message with you. But before we get into that, I want to take a moment, and we're going to be reading today from the book of Romans. So if you brought your Bible with you, if you wouldn't mind turning to Romans chapter 8, and Romans is about 90% of the way through your scripture. And just so you have an idea, kind of what's going on at this point in time, and, and, and a, little bit about the, a little bit about the New Testament, is the New Testament's broken up into sections. And the first section of the New Testament is four books called the Gospels. And these are the, this is the story of the life and times of Jesus. This is, um, this is the, this is, these were written by some, some by his disciples, other peoples who, people who journeyed and, and gathered information and wrote down the things that they saw that Jesus, that Jesus did and things that, that he said. And the second book, the, right after that, you run into the book of Acts, and that is a history book. That is a his, the history of the church. It's the history of what happened how did the church become, the, how did the bride of Christ begin to grow? How was it founded? How did it begin to explode all over the world? And then after that, we get into the, we get into the book of Romans and what are called the Pauline epistles. Now, these are letters from the apostle Paul to churches throughout, throughout the known world at that time, throughout that area where he was at, churches that he helped plant, churches that he continued to support, churches that he wanted to be able to provide some guidance for. And, and the, he, he spoke to them in a relevant way to things that were going on in their world at the time, but the truths that he taught them, the truths that he sent them are so applicable to our lives today and can teach us how to live Live in the way that God wants us to live. And so today, as we read from Romans chapter 8, I, I, I would love for you to join me. And we're going to be spending a lot of time in Romans 8 today. So if you got your Bible open, just leave it open there because we're going to be coming back to it quite a few times. So Romans 8, beginning in verse 28, says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons... Neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. 
If you would join me in prayer, I would appreciate it as, as we pray before we kick things off. So Heavenly Father, I just come to you today to say thank you. I thank you for just the, the amazing gift that you have given us of your word the amazing gift that you gave us of your son, and the amazing gift that you've given us of the ability to continue to gather together in glory and, and to be able to worship you freely. I pray today, Lord, that if anyone is here whose heart needs to be hardened so that it can be broken for you, that that happens. And if there's anyone here whose heart needs to be softened so that your the words land gently, that that happens as well. But above all else, Lord, I pray today that you're glorified. I give you this morning, I pray all these things in your name, amen. So welcome to week four of Burn the Ships. And we have been working through a series big idea over the course of the last four weeks that says we experience true freedom and fulfillment when we completely trust in Jesus as our Savior and wholeheartedly commit to following Jesus as Lord. We experience true freedom and fulfillment when we completely, first, trust that we need a Savior. And second, trust that His name is Jesus. And then when we wholeheartedly commit to following Him as Lord, means we submit to Him as Lord. You see, we can't have one without the other. Jesus can't be your Savior without first being your Lord. And the second you choose to submit to Him as Lord... You get him as savior as part of the deal. It's a great, it's a great thing. We can't separate these two. And, and, and we've been talking about this for the last three weeks. In week one, we learned that Jesus promises life to those who, who trust in him as savior and follow him as Lord. Jesus promises life to those who first submit to him as Lord and receive him as savior. John 10, 10 speaks about this. It juxtaposes the life, the life that Jesus provides with what the enemy, the thief, comes to do. Where it says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. I may have come that you may have life and have it to the full. I have come that you may have life and have it beyond all measure. And in week two, we, we started to look at this idea that if we've submitted to Jesus as Lord and received him as Savior, when Jesus is our Lord, sin is no longer our master. Sin is no longer the thing that holds us, that, that is our ruling entity. Jesus becomes that. Romans 6, 6 says that, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. And last week, we, we, we dug into this idea that we can burn the ship on comparison because we're supposed to be aware of things, but not compare. We're supposed to be aware of the blessings that God has given us in this earthly life, but not compare them to the blessings that we see in others. We're supposed to be aware of our limitations, but not compare them to the limitations of others. We're supposed to be aware of, the, of our circumstances, but not compare them to the circumstances of others because... Com because comparison leads to condemnation. And in Christ, when we are part of his family, when, we, when he is our Lord, condemnation is no longer part of the picture. Romans 8 says this, it says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. See, we've wrestled through this. There's this, this pathway that we're going on, and today I want to continue that pathway by asking a question. Who are you trying to please? Really? Who in this world are you trying to please? I mean, we all do that. At different stages in our life, we try to please different people. Kids, uh, they try to please teachers, maybe the new kid at school so they can get a new friend. Maybe they try to please their parents so that down the road when they do something that's not so pleasing, that, that it's not going to be so bad. At least that's what I remember doing myself. Um, and... In our teenage years, we try to please, we try to gain the attention, we try to gather the attention and gain the ple and please that first crush. Or maybe, maybe it's a sports team that we want to be a part of that, that um, we just hadn't been a part of before, but we want to try to get in that. Or a crowd that we, we, want, we want to be part of that we weren't a part of before. And as adults, this doesn't go away. We try to please maybe a prospective employer, maybe our spouse, Maybe, maybe a, um, a social circle that we would like to find ourselves as a part of. 
We, we, we try to please so many people, and sometimes that leads us to doing things that we wouldn't normally do. Sometimes that leads us to doing things that are, that are so counter who we say we are and who we know we are that it leaves us feeling, it leaves us feeling a lot less than worthy. You know, I've told you guys here before that when I was born, I was born with a disease that under 900 boys were born with the year that I was born. I am one of 17 that are currently alive and one of two that aren't connected to a machine. I had eight major surgeries before I was two years old. And part of the ramifications of that is there were, until I got to be about 14 or 15 years old and I developed some, so, some muscle tone, um, there were certain bodily functions I didn't have any control over. I remember walking down the hallway in middle school and certain things happening that became very embarrassing. And so my response to that was to do anything I could to gain acceptance by getting people to overlook what was so relevant in my life, what was so readily visible in my life. For sometimes, I, I tried to be the funny guy, and for those of you who know me, know that humor is not my spiritual gift. Um, somebody else wrote that down for me, so don't worry about that. If that was even funny, that was from somebody else. Um, I also became somebody whose words became very biting. My words became very biting because I knew that, in my mind, I knew that if I could get other people to look at the limitations of others, maybe they would overlook mine. And so I treated people very poorly. And this season in my life lasted for about three years where I fought really hard to gain the acceptance of others by doing things that were so totally against who I was. But there was this gentleman in my life, his name was Gene. And Gene's been heavy on my mind this week because Gene passed away and went to see Jesus this week. But Gene was a, was a calming voice in my life from when I was a little guy until just this last week, a constant voice of encouragement. And I remember having conversations with him where he, would, where he would say things like, hey, regardless of your circumstances and regardless of what other people have to think about you, you have a place where you're accepted. And if your stomach issues and some of these things, they never go away, Jesus loves you regardless. And that his love for me was not dependent upon my circumstances, but upon the station of my heart. You see, when I was young, those words, I, like I heard them, but they didn't sink in enough to change anything. But they've carried with me in my adult years as, as I attend, as, as sometimes, and maybe I'm the only one, but as I get tempted to fall back into that category of let's please other people and maybe do things that are outside of my character. Those words that Gene spoke, those words that Gene spoke, spoke I think, speak to, to us today. But the question, though, is why do we do this? Why do we lean so hard on pleasing other people? And I think it's this. It's because we all have a need to belong. We all have a need to belong. And guys, this isn't something that is new. This is as old as time itself. Adam and Eve were born into perfect communion with God and then sin. Then they chose, they willfully chose to sin, and perfect communion, perfect belonging with God was broken. And there became a hole in humanity that couldn't be filled by anything on earth. But, our, we, we, but So we have, from the get-go, a need to belong. And sometimes our need to belong can push us to extremes. Sometimes our need to belong can push us to extremes. And I think that we can probably all, at one point in time in our life, attest to this. We can all attest, and maybe, maybe this isn't something that you're dealing with right now, but it's something that you dealt with recently. Some, and, and, or, or there's somebody that you know that's striving really hard to get other people to accept them, to find their place that they belong. But they're searching and they're searching and they're searching and they're just coming up empty. It's, it, but thinking back on my story with Gene earlier and some of the stuff that I experienced 
when, when, when going through the worst of my people-pleasing times, not that it has gotten all that much better, but the worst of the times, I think that there are three key things that I want to draw out from that time that I know and I believe point us toward a truth that we all need today. You see, the first is this, is that when we are in people-pleasing mode, we will be tempted to compromise our relationship with God and our integrity. When we are in people-pleasing mode, we're tempted to try to fill in a gap by ourselves and compromise our relationship with God. And sometimes it'll step us into places where we compromise our integrity as well. The second thing that happens when we, that when we, when we are in people-pleasing mode is that we go to extremes to please people because we seek, get this, ultimate approval. Back to that Adam and Eve thing. It isn't the, it isn't the, it isn't the approval of, of, of Josh or Miranda that I really seek. Deep down inside of me, the approval that I seek is not theirs. That's earthly. The, the approval that I seek is eternal. You see, because the approval of other people, that's a placebo, my friends. It's nothing more than a placebo. I remember back to when... Um, my middle daughter, Gabby, was four years old, and she broke her arm, and it was a bad break. Bone came through the skin. It was a rough go. I'd tell you the whole story, but it would take me some time, and I might cry. And so we're not going to go all that way. Um, but I remember going to the hospital. We were at Children's Mercy. And, you know, they're, they're, they're going to have to put her to sleep to set this arm. And they had poked her 13 or 14 times trying to get an IV in her arm and she's just getting more frantic and her little veins are shriveling up even more and it's just not happening. And I remember clearly, I remember, I remember a lot of tears, but I remember one thing that she said. She goes, Daddy, give me a Band-Aid and let's go home. You see, in the mind of my four-year-old, a Band-Aid would fix a broken arm. And when we seek the approval of people, that's really what that is. It's us putting a Band-Aid on a broken arm. It kind of actually goes a little deeper than that. It's us putting a Band-Aid on a broken heart. It's a placebo. It makes us feel good in the moment, but it immediately goes away. I couldn't take her home with a Band-Aid on her arm. Her arm would have never healed. It wouldn't have worked. It would have been a bad day. If we consistently seek other people's approval, it's never going to work. And you see, and we seek, the other, we seek people's approval also because we are afraid of not having God's approval. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they hid because they knew that sin was not pleasing to God. And we have that same thing inside of all of us. This fear that we are not approval worthy. That God won't approve of us. And so we attempt to fill it up with other people's approval. Because honestly, oftentimes in our minds, in, in our limited understanding, the approval of others is easier to attain than the approval of God Almighty. Because we just can't measure up. And it leads us to fear. It leads us to a fear that we are going to be rejected. A fear, many other, a fear of many other things. And honestly, a fear that man is going to reject us as well. So we become someone that we're not. Scripture speaks about this in Proverbs. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, says in Proverbs 29, 25, Fear of the man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. The Apostle Paul continues on and speaks about this more further in Romans 8. He says, those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. He's going to be very clear about this. If you're in the realm of the flesh, you cannot please God. You, however, if you are dependent upon Christ, are not in the realm of flesh, but in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Do you see what this says? It says that living for the approval of others is a snare. It's a trap. It's a placebo. 
Because while I might get, I might temporarily get the approval of my friend James or my friend Marcus. That's temporary. That's not going to last. And then I'm going to have to move on to somebody else and try to please them and move on to somebody else and try to please them. And it's a never-ending trap. But living from God's approval as demonstrated in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is liberating and fulfilling. Living from the approval of, G- of, of God, living from God's approval brings us into that, that, that John 10.10 10 life, that abundant life, that fulfilling life that we spoke about earlier. We can live from the approval of God because of Jesus and his sacrifice. We can become his children. When we completely trust in him as Savior and commit to submitting to him as Lord, he burns the ship on our former life and our identity and calls us his. And church, hold on just a second. I need everyone's attention because this is so incredibly important. There is nothing ever that we can be called that is more important and greater than being called his. Nothing There is no title we can attain. There is no accolade that we can achieve. There is nothing that is of higher value than being called his. And John 1, 12 lays this out. He says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called children of God. There's no greater place to be Regardless of our circumstances, we can be called children of God. Regardless of the ailments, the limitations, the things that come with it, we can be called His. And when we are called His, when we live out of that, we can boldly say our teaching big idea, which is I will live from my identity in Christ. And stop living for the approval of others. I will live from who Christ says I am. And stop living to get other people to call me something that's far less. I can live from the never-ending, unchanging, completely eternal love of Christ. Rather than living for the temporary affirmation of someone else you see when we at when that happens when we own that statement when we become a member of god's family we got to be honest though guys uh, the question is does does that guarantee us a, an easy life the answer is no it doesn't in all honesty it kind of guarantees in some ways the opposite does it guarantee that, that our, our addictions are immediately going to go away. No, we're never promised that. Does it guarantee that everything that ails us is immediately going to go away? No, we're never promised that. Does it guarantee that we're going to be able, that we're going to have health, wealth, and, and a life of extreme comfort? No, we're never promised that. But there are some amazing assurances that come with our new life in Christ, and they always lead to hope, faith, and belonging. So what does it look like to belong to Jesus? What does it look like to live out of our identity in Him? What does it look like to live out of our station in Him rather than for the pleasure of others, for the people pleasing, for the, uh, for the words of other people. And it's this, I, I, I've got three things, and we're going to unpack these for just a second. People pleasers fear rejection. But in Jesus, I'm accepted into God's family. People pleasers fear rejection, and honestly, rejection is a scary thing. Rejection is just scary, but when we are a member of God's family, we can burn the ship on the fear of rejection and pleasing others. And we see this so clearly in Romans 8. I told you we were going to be spending some time in Romans 8. So we're in Romans 8, beginning in verse 14. And it says this, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought you out 
brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You see, when we are accepted into his family, when we are adopted, we will know security, we will know authority, and we will know assurance. We will know security as, as we are co-heirs of an eternal inheritance. Not a temporary one, but an eternal inheritance. And we will acknowledge God's authority as we get to call him Father. And we get to experience him as the Father that we all long for. And we get an assurance in whose we are as the Holy Spirit testifies that we are God's children. And see, and with that comes the life that I spoke about earlier. A life that isn't marked with health, wealth, and earthly comfort. But, um, but one in which we share in his sufferings so that we may, may also one day share in his glory. You see, in Jesus, just like Jesus faced, we will face earthly rejection. And friends, it will hurt but Jesus is not unfamiliar with this. Throughout his life here on earth and, 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 in the thousand, and, and, and in the thousands of years since, Jesus has faced rejection. And I want, to, I want to make this very clear. Before you were in Christ Jesus, you were part of that rejection. I know that doesn't feel good, but it's the truth. Apart, if you are not in relationship with Christ, if you have not submitted to him as Lord, you are part of the rejection that Jesus faces every day willfully for us. And we will do that and we will face that with him. And, and we will also, but as we, as we share in this suffering, we'll also grow in our character. We will grow in the fruit of the Spirit. We will grow in love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and in self-control. And, and, and we will find a belonging, a hope, and a joy that only Christ can offer. The second thing that marks the difference between living a life of pleasing others and living a life from the pleasure of God is that people pleasers fear exposure. But in Jesus, I'm able to embrace my weaknesses and confess my sins. You see, exposure is scary when all you have done is hide from others who you really are out of fear of rejection. But when we are grounded in our identity as a member of the family of God, we can burn the ship on the fear of, on the, on the fear of exposure. And we can embrace the truth of what Scripture says about our weaknesses and our sins. Romans 8.26 says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The Holy Spirit is on our side, and when we have no words, he has it for us. When we don't know what to do, the Holy Spirit is with us in our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12 continues on. I love that these, these tie together so well. It says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see, exposure is scary, but with Jesus, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. It, we don't have to fear exposure. We can embrace our weaknesses because in times of weakness, the Holy Spirit will come alongside and, and give us a strength that is not of ourselves. And it also says in this, we can confess our sins. And there's something amazing that comes with this. James 5.16 says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. You see, when we are in Jesus, exposure, while it will happen, isn't something that we need to fear. It is something that we can embrace because... In our weakness and in our confession, we will experience the strength of God and the healing that comes from no longer hiding. 
You see, so in Jesus, we can burn the ship of the fear of rejection and the fear of exposure. And we can also burn another ship that I think is the root cause for many of these, for both of these things, and that is the fear of the controlling expectations of others. You see, people pleasers fear the controlling expectations of others, but in Jesus, I'm able to acknowledge my limitations. You see, the, the, that, that fear of others' expectations, either real or imaginary, lead us to, to, to say, if I don't live up to this, to be afraid of, if I don't live up to this, I'm going to be rejected. Or they're going to see something in me that I'm not ready to share with the world around me. They're going to, get to they're going to see something inside of me that I'm not ready for everyone to see because it doesn't make me look so good. But in Jesus, I'm able to acknowledge my limitations. I love what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 7, where he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I, do, what I hate, I do. There's a lot of I do's in there. But what he's really saying is, I do have limitations. And my limitations are called sin. And the things that I can't, that I don't want to do, the things that I know I shouldn't do, that's what I do. The things that I, the things that I know I should do, those are the things that I don't do. We can acknowledge our limitations. We can acknowledge our limitations. We can, we can, we can, we can say out loud, listen, yes, I'm limited, but in Christ... I am made new, and I am his. You see, in Jesus, we are accepted into God's family. In Jesus, we are able to embrace our weaknesses and confess our sins. And in Jesus, we, are, we can acknowledge our limitations. And do you know why? Because in Jesus... I am improved and loved. And in Jesus, you are approved and loved. I want to say this one more time. In Jesus, we are approved and loved, period. There is no greater truth. In Jesus, we are approved and loved. You see, Jesus, who was God, became man, lived the perfect life that we couldn't live, died a death that our sins said we deserved, rose again on the third day, and is seated with the Father in heaven, waiting for the day of his return so he can make all things new again. Did it all for us. All the suffering he went through was for us. All the suffering he went through was for you. All the suffering he went through was for me. When we're at our lowest, it was for us. When we were at our best, it was for us. Because, my friends, there's not a lot of difference between our lowest and our best. If we're really being honest. All the rejection he faced and continues to face is so that we can come into right standing with God Almighty. Jesus did this for us and so even though stepping into life with Jesus doesn't promise a, a, the, the, the most comfortable life here on, on earth, it promises a life eternal with a God who never stops loving those who are his and will always approve of us and always has open arms and always says, come to me. Jesus did all of this for us. But the question is, do you believe it? The question is, do you believe that Jesus came, lived, died, rose again, and will come again one day for you? Do you believe it? It's the most important question you'll ever answer in your entire life. Is do you believe that Jesus did this and are you willing to submit to him as Lord? Because if the answer is that, to, that is yes, there's no ship behind us that we can't burn. Because there's nothing behind us that should draw us back. Guys, the band's about to come out and play, but before they do, I want to remind you of what the Apostle Paul said. I want to read through his answer to why we can believe and does he believe that Jesus did all of that for him. And we know 
that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom Christ, whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one that, who condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus.
on to redemption by the grace in his eyes. If grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. So heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss in my heart. Heart turns violently inside of my chest, and I don't have the time to maintain these regrets. When I think about all the way that He loves us, oh how He loves us, oh how He loves us, oh how He. Stepping into relationship with Jesus is something that you haven't done. But today, you felt the word of God pull at your heart and say, that's a relationship, that's a life that I want. We're going to have prayer partners along the edge, and I encourage you to go talk with one of them. Pray with one of them. Engage with one of them as they, and they'll share, they'll share this life.